Hey, thanks for joining us today at Sunnyside. It's bulb class time here, 11 a.m. I can hear the raindrops pounding on the roof, so hopefully you can, you can hear me okay. Nicole will probably let me know if, uh, if not. So say hi to Nicole. She's in the background there. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. She always has the pretty background. I got the wood pallet wall here, but we're rustic sheep here, so that's okay. But, uh, thanks again for joining us. We're going to talk a little bit about spring ephemerals, spring bulbs, um, you know, great time of year to kind of think ahead four, five, six months and be prepared for spring. Uh, this is the time of year when you purchase spring bulbs, plant them in the fall, that you get to enjoy in your yard uh, coming after the holidays. So we'll go through quite a bit. I got a slideshow to show you. Um, I'm going to move a table in here towards the end and plant a little bulb pot from my house. Uh, so I'll kind of show you what I do with some of the when you're out of room for bulbs in the ground, we just add them into pots and add, add more that way. But uh, spring ephemerals, you know, are, are an easy way to add a pop of color. You know, we could talk, you know, pretty much mid-December, January, February, March, all the way into April, May, uh, sometimes even early June. And we've got some spring blooming bulbs that will cover those that time frame and, and give us a little, uh, little, little flower power come springtime. Um, there's a lot to choose from, as you're going to see in the slideshow. Um, you know, that's a really easy way you can pick your color, show your own style, you know, do what you kind of like in your yard. Just because I pick uh, certain things doesn't mean that you might not like the same thing. So uh, I don't do a lot of pink. I'm always easy with that one. And that may be your color. So we, we can do some more pastels, uh, certainly for your selection. Um, one thing I will say right now, because we're going to go through a lot of bulbs, but I'll just pull up a good old Dutch master daffodil. So we get packaged bulbs this time of year. You know, really pay attention to the package that come in. This little tiny little bag is going to tell you everything you need to know. You know, a lot of questions probably, how deep do I plant this? How many do I need? You know, if I turn this bag around and I look at my chart right here, this is going to tell me spacing, soil depth, everything I need to know. It's going to tell me on the front if I'm critter resistant, the height when it blooms. You know, typically packages that we sell we're going to say early spring, mid, mid spring, or late spring. When we say early, you know, it could be as early as into late January, February, early March, mid spring, kind of that March, April time frame. And then late spring will get us into that late April, May into early June. So depends on what the weather does, um, of course, up here. But typically that's going to be your approximate bloom time. Uh, one thing I promised I would start including uh, some animal discussions on, in these classes. We'll do this even better next year, but a lot of folks end up asking about deer. In the case of bulbs, it could be Mr. Squirrel, Mr. Deer, Mr. Rabbit, even Mr. Raccoon at my house. Um, you know, if we get a proper repellent down, we can help with that. But if we start with deer, you know, the vast, the vast majority of, of spring bulbs that we talk about today are gonna be critter resistant. The deer don't like to eat the foliage. Daffodils are totally safe. Squirrels are kind of 50-50. If you ask me about a specific one, I'll tell you if the squirrel will come borrow it and move it somewhere else for you after you plant it. But certainly there's, there's a lot of options specifically for deer resistance, things that you can plant, naturalize, and the deer will not come and browse the foliage as it comes up in the springtime, okay? So I'm gonna share my screen here. Give me one second. We're just going to show you a few slides. We'll kind of go fast and furious so we can finish here on time, right, Nicole? So this is, a, you know, just kind of an idea, some general pictures. You know, if you're really into spring bulbs, you know, your landscape could look like that right there. You know, that is the creme de la creme, you know, masses and masses of, of different colors, combinations, bloom times. Um, I don't know that I would ever plant perhaps the thousands of bulbs that are in that picture, but, you know, planting 25 of this, 50 of that, you know, is going to really give you a, a pop of flower power come springtime in the landscape. Now, if we look at some basics, <clears throat> you know, just kind of some, some bold basics here before we look at, at specific ones. You know, like I mentioned, we're always staying a season ahead. I can't tell you how many hundred people will come down here next February, next March, next April, as they see these little creatures blooming in the neighbor's yard or in our place or anywhere they drive and they'll ask, well, where can I buy tulip bulbs or daffodil bulbs or whatever? This is the time of year we do that. In the spring, you're stuck 
with very limited selection and they would be growing in pots. You know, I pulled up that, that uh, the, the, the bag of the daffodils there, you know, I'm going to get eight huge bulbs, which you would never get in the spring, you know, for $10. If you come down here in the spring, I'm going to buy one little miniature version of that with a small flower and a pot for three or $4. So cost effective ways is buy the bags and get them planted here in fall so we can enjoy them in springtime. You know, a huge one in our neck of the woods as I laugh and I hear the rain pounding on the roof is drainage. You know, we're entering the rainy season. I hate to remind our locals, but we have very nice four months of summer and eight months with a little gray at spring, which is fine. It keeps things green and healthy, but we have to have good drainage to, to, to grow bulbs. We can't have heavy hard pan clay, water puddling up in the wintertime. Certainly we get a deluge and the water goes through the soil great. But if we tend to walk out and have squishy areas in our gardens and the landscape beds, not the best place for bulbs. We don't want standing water. We want that water draining through the soil uh, through the winter time. You know, size matters is a huge one, you know, and I, I go to Costco and get groceries and I go to the drugstore and the grow. Everybody has bulbs for sale. I mean, you can almost walk in any retail of any kind and see a little rack of bulbs for sale in the fall. Um, sometimes the prices look great, but really look at the size because the size does matter with bulbs. You know, we probably carry a little more premium, larger gray bulb. It's going to give me that much more flower, that much more energy come the following spring. If I go cheap, they'll always grow, but you may be disappointed with the flowering the first year. We'll have to wait till that second year before they can enlarge and grow and provide us the bloom that we're expecting that second season. So pay attention to the grade that's always marked on the, on the package. You know, look at different blends and mixes. You know, sometimes you walk into a place like Sunnyside and we've got 80 varieties of tulips and daffodils and this and that all over the shelves. And it, it's sometimes overwhelming. You know, I, ooh, I like that. I like this. What do I do with all that? Look at some of the blends because that's an easy way for you as a gardener to pick up a bulk package. And it might have a tulip mixed with a daffodil or a, a muscari mixed with this. And it will a lot of times have two or three things in that bulb together that make a great presentation, something a little shorter, something a little taller, con contrasting colors, different bloom times. Uh, that might be an easy way to get you kind of started in the, the bulb addiction that I have too. So, so may maybe try a, a little mix as, as an option. Uh, pay attention to the heights. You know, as you look at these packages and you're locating them in your garden, how much height do I really want? Is it gonna be right on the border? I want something short. Is it gonna be behind? maybe a shrub where I can enjoy the flower over the top. You know, look at your heights and that will dictate kind of where you want to place them in the different areas in the garden as well. Like I mentioned, check your depth always. You know, look at that package and try to stay down in the ground. You know, digging a little two inch, three inch hole above hard pan and throwing some tulips down and covering it back up with a mound of mulch is not the answer. You've got to get these things down into the soil structure most of the time. We're down there in the four, six inch range, even a little bit deeper on some, but usually six inch for the majority of our narcissus, daffodils, tulips, things like that. Um, you know, space them properly. It's going to tell you right on there. I break this rule. I'll raise my hand as, as, a, as, a, as a rule breaker on this one, but, you know, give them room to develop. If, if I'm choosing a bulb, I want it to naturalize and, and have it for years in my landscape. So packing 10 of them in a little tiny one foot circle will look great next year, and then we're gonna start to crowd and peter out. I'll have to go back and work on that patch again. If we spread them out according to the package by the variety, now we've got room for those bulbs to develop, naturalize, and give me a really nice mass of color long-term in the landscape. Um, you know, I'll use multiple varieties. You're gonna see me when I plant my pot, I'll go through the things I chose, the colors I like, the different bloom times, but I can stagger the flower and, and have a really attractive bulb area feasibly that again goes from January all the way into late, late spring, depending on what I choose. You know, always plant in masses, you know, some bulbs, even some of the alliums come one giant bulb in a pot. That might be the exception where I want really one really cool thing, or maybe three if it's a larger plant like alliums. You know, daffodils and tulips, grabbing a little three here and three over there and one here, you know, yes, I'll get flowers on them. Maybe, maybe it's your yard, you can do what you like, but I'd rather have you mass them, make a presentation, you know, 10 or 15 
in a little area is going to look very sharp come springtime versus one here and three there and two here and one here kind of thing. And the last thing I'd mention on here, because I bet you there'll be a lot of questions at the end, is let the bulb tell you when it's done for the year. So if we fast forward to next spring, our, our narcissus daffodil comes up. I enjoy the beautiful yellow flower. Okay, the flower is turning brown. Now it's developing a little seed. It, the leaves are still green, you know, but the flower stalk is done. Yes, I could go out and nip that deadhead, that flower. That's what I do, but I do not want to cut that foliage back. You have to leave the green foliage on the bulb until it is done. Then we can cut it off when it has turned yellow and brown. So a lot of these spring things, you know, it's probably June, you know, late May, June, depending on how our weather goes. Now I can go out and remove the foliage at the base. They're gone, disappeared. We'll see you again next spring as they go dormant. If, you know, essentially what, what the bulb is, is I bloom with last year's energy, okay? Now I've got my foliage up. It's storing energy in that bulb for the next season's push. So if you walk out there in April, my daffodils are done. I don't want to look at you anymore and you cut them all off. You're going to really sacrifice the bloom power come 2023 at that point. I need to store energy, fatten myself up underground there so that the next season I'm ready to go with another flower push for you, okay? Now, if we just look at a couple tools real quick, you know, a lot of times we want to make life easier. We don't need to run around there and dig holes um, too bad. You can use a trowel. You know, I use a trowel a lot. I use both of these things here too. A bulb planter will make your life easier. A little clip device I can stick in the ground, pick up soil, drop it. You know, I can dig a perfect little round hole. The nice thing with those bowl planters is I've got a measuring device right on the side of there. So that's going to let me know, sweet, I got down four inches. I got down six inches. Now I've got the right depth as well, according to what I'm planning. The roto auger are, is a great tool if you're mass planning. I use that quite a bit. I've got a cordless power drill. It just snaps in like a drill bit. And I can walk out in my yard and plant, you know, 30, 40, 50 crocus very quickly without digging another hole and another hole and another hole. I can zip through a, a garden area, get through some small roots as well and get those perfect little holes in a pattern I want, then grab my bag, drop the crocus in, slough the soil back over, throw some food on them and I'm good to go for the next season, okay? So if you kind of think of those two tools, might be a good time saver for you. The drill bits should last you forever unless you're digging kind of trying to drill through concrete. I think typical soil up here, you'll be fine with lasting for quite a while. So remember that motto, you know, we, we, we usually, we was very prominent a few years ago, but literally dig, drop, done. I mean, that's a great bulb motto, very easy uh, little creatures to add to our landscape that we don't have to do a lot of extra work with. Now try to always go green. You know, every class I, I teach around here, I try to promote kind of going natural, organic, Using natural organic fertilizers is huge to build the soil chemistry, add microbes, and, and again, have healthy, healthy plants across the entire landscape. But when we talk bulbs specifically, you know, the fertilizers we want to look at are a bulb food. We carry EB Stone products here. EB Stone bulb food is excellent. That's going to give me the growth I need and the flower power uh, by using that consistently. Or bone meal is another really easy one. You know, some folks don't like bone meal. Um, others use bulb food. I don't care which one you use. Either one of those is going to add the appropriate amount of phosphorus into my soil chemistry that's going to create the bud that I want and the resulting uh, flower that I'm looking for as well, okay? I always use compost. You know, if I'm mixing, whether I'm drilling holes or bulb planting, whichever, I'll have my big buckets of compost next door, and I'm going to try to always mix some of that about one-third to two-thirds with my native soil, help with the drainage, add a little nutrition, and then also use that as a mulch when I'm done. Maybe I plant a patch. I'm like everybody. I'm getting old and I forget where I might have put my bulbs, but at least I can remember for a season because when I'm done planting, I'll leave that nice fresh patch of black compost over the top and I can walk out and go, oh wait, that's right. I planted something there. I better not add another, another shrub or something else come springtime. Then I probably get used to, to where I added them. So try a little compost for an amendment. If I ever battle, I don't think you're going to ever have to worry. I don't never have had in my yard and ever had to worry a whole lot about bugs or disease or certain things. Um, you know, if you're going to, if you do have to fight something like that, you know, there's great natural products, neem oil, spinosad, insecticidal soap, 
we can take care of most simple insect issues that might get on a bulb or the foliage come springtime with a real safe uh, natural spray as well. And maybe disease, if we're fighting it a little bit, you know, that's something, again, we can, we can always dip our bulbs in copper, a solution of copper before we plant them. That's a great natural fungicide or battle something with, use a, a, a product like Serenade. Now, now we call that revitalized, but it, it sounds like the worst thing ever. It's a biofungicide. It almost sounds like hazardous material, but that essentially is our safe fungicide. We use a solution of the revitalized. That bacillus in there is, is, a, is basically a fungus eating bacteria. So I can use that all over my yard and not have to worry about going chemical route, okay? Now, if we look at a couple of products, you're gonna see me planting my bull pot. I've already did half the work last night and filled it up halfway, so we don't have to watch me pour soil. But I use the Edna's Best Organic Potting Soil from EB Stone. And I think it's the best potting soil on the market. It's got great nutrition, great drainage, all the organic goodies we want in there in a good high quality potting soil. I use that for everything in, in a pot at my house, but including the bulbs as well. So I will plant straight into that as my potting mix. Again, the compost I mentioned for the soil. For me, you're gonna see me plant my pot. When I go home tonight, uh, that's when I will water it so I don't have to carry such a heavy pot out to my truck after work. And I will take my compost stash behind the house, EB stones, what I have there, I always have bales of that around. And I will add a two inch layer of that compost to the top of my bowl planter. When I set it out, I'll water it, add the compost, throw some extra food on top when I get home. I'll put it where it's gonna be and it'll stay there the entire winter. And I won't, won't have to touch it at all till I start to see these things emerging next January. And then I get to enjoy my container for a few months in springtime. There's your two foods. You know, we'll have, we have plenty of both of those around. I will tell you with EB Stone, um, the most of their fertilizers come in a pouch. I brought Ultra Bloom, which I'll add into my pot, but I've got an easy pouch with an industrial kind of Velcro seal on there. So I can use a little bit, seal it up, put it in the garage, keep it dry and have it forever. Bowl food comes like that. This year, you're gonna see those boxes that they've done transferred those bags as well. So we have the box bone meal now, but you're gonna see that available in the pouch here come springtime. And I always have to put the funny squirrel on there because I love my animals. I wouldn't trade not having the squirrel run around my yard, but you know, once in a while they get a little frustrating. I'm a little OCD and I like exactly where I put my bulbs to stay there. Mr. Squirrel likes to move a few for me. So once in a while, I'll take some repels all if I know crocus is the main one with me. They like to relocate, um, probably thinking they're gonna stash it and forgot where they left it. And then I get to see it. What is that doing over there next spring? So try some repels all, it's a natural animal repellent. It's not gonna hurt anything. You're not gonna kill the squirrel, uh, but it hopefully irritates his nose and his mouth and his eyes. And he says, okay, I'm not digging these bulbs up anymore. I'm out of here. And he'll head to the neighbors and work on hers instead, okay? So try, try, this, try a little repellent. Um, I will tell you with my bowl pots, I find some wood around here, I'll knock on it, but they haven't messed with my uh, bowl pots for a few winters. So I probably won't go home and sprinkle repels all on it. If I walk out in a month and I see a little hole getting dug here and there, yes, I will throw some repels all on there and tell Mr. Squirrel, no, I do not want peanuts mixed with my bowl pot. Leave them alone. I'd rather have them enjoy the flowers come next spring. The last one here, you know, tulip rot, you know, that's the main one I see a little bit. When you purchase a package of tulips, you know, look at the bulbs real carefully. Um, if you wanna be real safe, just take those bulbs before you win the ground, mix up just a little paint can or a little pail of copper fungicide or revitalize. And if I just dip those in there, let them set for a few seconds, I've got a shield that'll dry on. Now I can go ahead and pop those in the ground and I, I'm even a little bit safer, okay? So there's some bulb container ideas. Um, like I said, I'll plant mine here in, in just a few minutes. Um, but that's kind of what I like to do. You know, I want to come home in the winter and see some pots. Every gardener's got a bazillion pots behind their house they're doing nothing with. It could be a black plastic pot. It could be something fancy like the one I have. It could be wood. It could be anything. Terracotta, you got to be careful of cracking in the winter. Be real careful of terracotta. But all those outdoor frost-proof type pots, you know, if I'm not doing anything with it, sweet. I'll go get a package of bulbs or two, plant it up. I can always leave it even behind the house where it's going to get rain and not dry out. 
and then I can pop that up on the porch, you know, come springtime and enjoy the flowers for a little bit. I think I know I buy flowers for my sweetie wife on occasion. Going down to the flower shop, I'm going to pay probably more for a little bunch of cut tulips, uh, bringing them home from them versus growing a pot of tulips, cutting them, bring them into the house and enjoying them come springtime. So a lot of times I think of some specialty things like the tulips is sweet. I'm going to grow those just so I can cut them and have a nice bouquet in the house for a couple of weeks come spring. Now, if we look at some bulbs, we're going to whip through this pretty fast so we can get done on time. But I'm just going to go through and show you kind of some of the possibilities here. We've got a number of different crocus we can bloom. These are very short, just three, four inches tall. I can do whites, purples, lavenders, yellows. You'll see a, the next slide will show you the new oranger one, which I am sold out of already. But uh, the crocus is an easy way. If I want to naturalize and make a carpet, of something very low. Crocus is one of my favorites. I use them underneath Japanese maples, deciduous shrubs in my yard. They'll be in my planter. It's a really easy bulb to grow. They're very small, very short, and an easy one to naturalize. You're going to hear me say that day at, time after time. Naturalize is what I'm looking for. I want to plant a bag of 10 or 15, and I want to see it continue to develop and get better and better every year. That's what we mean when we say naturalize. So a couple good crocus. There's the orange one called Orange Monarch. We go to the second one here is Hyacinth. Now Hyacinth, you'll see me plant a couple in my pot. You know, this is another early one that will come up in that late January, February to early March time. Great smell. This is one we're gonna buy for fragrance as well. I have Hyacinth all around my garden. We're walking up to the front door. Disappeared way last spring. I haven't seen him for a year. I hope they come back. They always do in the, in the springtime. But I'll start to see foliage come up after the holidays, and then I'll get to enjoy a really nice presentation of hyacinth flowers for a couple months come spring. They smell great by the door. I can cut them and bring them in again. We plant these a little bit deeper than crocus, but it's still not a, a giant tall one. There's a lot of different hyacinths around, but typically I'm going to have, with flower, a plant that's still only maybe 8 or 10 inches tall, it's very manageable for a nice low border come spring. One maybe you haven't seen, um, I always give Mr. Smith here, the owner, Whistling Gardener credit for my addiction of, of winter aconites, we call them, or, or arianthus. This is one of my faves these days. I've put a lot of these in in the last 10, 12 years now. If you've got shade, you want to pop a color, even sometimes late December, but definitely January and February, this is one that will naturalize and form a really low carpet in total shade even. When you buy them, you're probably like, what's that crazy fool selling me? Because they look like dead, dried up raisins. They don't even look like bulbs. But boy, we sprinkle those out in the ground and plant them right. You're going to have a beautiful patch forever. Um, that's another really easy one that will give you some really early flower. You know, fertile areas. You know, some people call them checkered lilies. There's all kinds of names. You know, these are a great woodland type bulb. If I want maybe an interesting flower, you'll see quite a few here, I'll show you. Um, and something that clumps more, maybe a little bigger uh, plant, fritillaries might be one that you want to try. They're awesome for that part sun, part shade. They need good drainage. Make sure we don't put those where they get too wet in the wintertime. Uh, but you've got a lot of good options for different fritillaries. You can see a perialis here if you like orange. Lutea is a great yellow, you know, just to let you know, I mean, that's a clump of foliage and then a stalk and then that big flower a cluster hanging down on top of there. The Ligrius, you see another kind of checkered flower with that knot hanging down. So lots of good fritillarias out there if you want to try. We do have some of those available and you can probably find a bunch of those online too. Some, some more interesting colors. There's a lot of fritillarias out there. Now, if we go really early, if we look at something like snowdrops, you know, Galanthus is one that's going to smell a little bit. It's always going to be bright white, a little bit of lime green in the flower as well. But that's one of those early, early winter type bulbs. This is one that's going to be blooming even if we have snow on the ground. I will see these up by late December and January doing their thing. So that's one of the first things that we'll see emerge every year, even a little bit before the crocus most of the time. If we have some things to naturalize, now this one I'll kind of chuckle and smile, 
if we look at something like Scylla or wood hyacinth, uh, you know, you can see the amount of those in that picture right there. Uh, this is one the squirrel will like to dig up and relocate for you. Uh, I've had a number of these show up in my yard that I didn't even plant over the years, but this is one that's really good for naturalizing. If you had the room and you wanted one of the more uh, impressive flower displays come spring, you know, take a woodland garden like that, part sun, part shade, and mass plant something like Scylla. Those will naturalize very well, and you'll have a spectacular spring flower show that will go dormant and then again give you even more coming, coming that, that next season. The Pushkinia is another type of this quill as well. If you like a little different color flower, that's going to be a little more interesting with the white, with the blue striping on it. Same idea. That's one I plant a few. I'm going to have more and more every season as those develop into, into a nice patch. Same with the glory of the snow. You know, these are kind of all really early ones that I will see come late winter to very early spring that are all excellent for naturalizing. Same with the spring star flower. We can get a little more towards blue with that one as well. And then snowflakes. You know, a lot like snowdrops, maybe a little bigger plan if I want a little taller. And the snowflakes, I think, have an interesting flower head. You take that little lime green, a touch of color on the tip. That's a really pretty flower. Uh, you don't see those around quite as much, but another perfect woodland naturalizing part sun, part shade bulb for, for, uh, for coming for winter, late winter, early spring. Now, if we fast forward a little later in the season, uh, we look at alliums. You know, these are in the onion family. I'm always going to have a short little clump of foliage blades and then a tall stock with the flower ball on top. Now, there's a zillion different alliums. I use these a lot in my garden, uh, mixed here and there. This is one I like, five here, five there, three here, five there just to add something fun. You know, speaking as the, the, the old dad of a six and a 10 year old, I think we're past the wiffle ball bat stage where my sons like to decapitate my alliums every spring. They left them alone last year. So I hope I get to enjoy them here uh, come next year. So uh, alliums are one. You could get almost up to like soccer ball size flower. If you feed these right, choose the right species, various, sizes of flower and various colors. And, and, and I think these are a fun one to grow, really easy. Um, you'll see me pop a couple of these in, in my bowl pot here as well. There's a, another couple another couple of alliums. You kind of like the open flower with the, almost the fireworks look to it. Or Staphii or Schubertii it looks absolutely like a little fireworks cluster there. Uh, you can see that really nice foliage and a pretty good size flower. I mean, that right there is getting up about twice the size of a sock ball when we look at that bloom come springtime. Alliums are always going to be a little later. So, <coughs> excuse me, we'll see the foliage come up with daffodils and tulips and everything else. But when we get to that bloom time, we're talking more something into May to early June. So that's going to extend my spring bulb season until we get into summertime with the dahlias and, and the rest of the bulbs too. Okay. A really early one again would be iris reticulata. I've got a couple little patches of these in, in one of my garden borders. Another one that I'll see come up in that January, early February time frame. If I just want a short, you know, little less than six inch, whites, purples, yellows, typically they'll come in a little blended bag. Um, that would give you a little miniature iris flower power very, very early uh, for late winter. Uh, Muscari, you know, to me is a lot like the Scylla. You know, I threw some of these out on technically not my bank, but the city bank at my house, just because I wanted a little bit of spring bulbs out there. And that's just one you could throw in a couple here, a couple there, they'll multiply, and you always have those reliable, we always call them kind of grape hyacinths. They're not really hyacinths, but they look a little bit like them. Uh, this is one we could naturalize very easily and get blues, purples, whites, pinks. You can find a number of different muscari around. A cyclamen is one that typically, you might find it online in bulb form, but this is grown from a coom or a type of bulb. Cyclamen is always the fall. So typically these emerge in the fall and the cold. Sometimes you can buy them in in the summertime, plant them even a little bit earlier than the things we're talking about today. But again, if I've got 
a shady woodland garden, a little bit of sun's flying. I'm looking for something really cool. This is a plant that starts right now and goes all the way through the winter into next spring. And I'll have a really cool foliage, a nice little spot of flower power here and there. And then when we get warm, disappears for the summer, just like our spring bulbs do. And we'll see you again in the fall as they start to emerge. That's the heterofolium. This is the coom, if you like a little silver leaf and a little more pink flower. Now, if we whip through a bunch of these two major categories, yeah, we're doing good on time still, Nicole. Um, if we whip through these two major categories, I'm gonna go fast and furious because there is a lot of tulips and a lot of narcissus or daffodils to choose from. I would suggest, again, you come down, take a look at the selection uh, that we carry quite a few different ones. They're selling out fast, so don't wait long. But we do have quite a bit of different styles of these to choose from right now on both these last two categories. So lots of different tulips. You can kind of, again, we record this. So if I go fast, you can go back and catch some of the names if you like. But you can come down and, and see the packages here as well. So lots of earlies. We've got double early tulips. No couple different varieties there. You can see double flower. Some of them will have fragrance. Check your package. We've got single earlies if we want classic tulips. This is what I usually go for for an early. And then you'll see Darwin's for mid for me. But again, lots of color options, every color in the rainbow. Check my heights, all the same things we're talking about. If we look at Foster's tulips or Emperor tulips, I always try to show those because not only do I have a nice tulip flower I can enjoy in the yard or cut and bring in as, as, a, as, a, as a cup flower, I've got really nice foliage on that particular one as well. That Purmissima Blonde, you can see the variegation. So I'm gonna have a pretty clump of foliage to enjoy in addition to that flower coming out as well. Now, if we talk tulips, you know, I'm, a, I'm all about species tulips myself. You're gonna see me plant, I love orange. You're gonna see me put some orange tulips in my bowl planter here when I plant it at the end. Um, and I add tulips for seasonal color. I myself, never get tulips to come back so well. You know, if I dig them and store them and mess with them, sure. But I'm a lot of times buying a little bag of tulips just for that coming season. I want to enjoy a little flower. Maybe I cut them, bring them in, leave them in the landscape. If you come back next year, great. You know, I'm happy to see you again. If you don't, it's not the end of the world. If I'm planting tulips for long term, I'm looking for species tulips. These are things I have all over my hot south-facing rockery right never here. These are plants that will naturalize. They're a little shorter. I think some really cool flowers that you wouldn't expect to see from tulip. These are all three uh, pictures from my yard, things I've have growing uh, here and there. The fried egg ones are my favorite. My, my, I call them the fried egg tulips there. The tart is in the middle. It looks like a little carpet of egg yolks when those bloom back in my garden. Um, but these will take a lot of sun. They don't need a lot of water, very easy to grow. I should admit this, I don't know that I've ever fed them. I compost, I mulch, I do all that stuff, but I've never went back and said, ooh, you need bone meal. They just fend for themselves and add, add a nice little a touch of spring color to my landscape. So look at species tulips. We get quite a few in here um, and you'll see right on that package again, that magic word, great for naturalizing. If we get into some mid spring season, we get into some triumph tulips. A lot of times two colors, mixed together, really exquisite form and some really nice color combinations. Suncatcher, that's the one I like there, there's my color. Then we have the Darwins. I'm, you'll see me plant a few orange Darwin tulips in my pot here, like I said, but again, all the colors in the rainbow, easy to grow. I can pick my mid spring, late spring, a couple of different height ranges on those, depending on the variety but that's gonna be my typical tulip. I think most people that, that, that do tulips, this is usually the genre they're, they're in. You see again, some different colors going. And then if we get into the late stuff, you know, maybe I'm getting into that late April, May time frame. We can still have late tulips as well. Angelique is one of my favorites and I'm not even a pink guy, but that one's got great color and really good smell. That's one we'll get some fragrance on as well. You'll see a number of different options and other colors for those. That's some fun ones. You know, we have a couple pair of tulips around. We get some lily flowering tulips around. Um, these are kind of fun. You know, if you wanted something a little different, I think they're great candidates to do in containers myself because I can really show off the flower, maybe take the bulbs later and transplant them and see if I can keep them going. 
uh, but certainly something fun and, and eye-catching you can put in a little pot. You know, pear tulip again there, the verdifolia. It's got some really cool color and flower for them. That looks like a florist quality one to me. And then Greggy is the last one there. So this is one, again, taken in my yard at the edge of one of my borders. You know, I chose that's a, a, another species tulip I think naturalizes very well. But I wanted something low I could use along the border. I don't have, you don't have to do orange. There's other colors as well. Um, but that one, again, the foliage is what it adds to me. You know, you can see by the picture there, I've got kind of a blue-green leaf. I've got some dark red burgundy speckling on it. So as that comes up, it looks really attractive. It's a nice foliage as well as giving me the, the flower power that I want. Now, if we look at some daffodils, you know, again, all kinds of styles and heights. I mean, I could pick any color, Corolla, sepal, all yellow, white with yellow, pink with yellow, orange and white. I could cross over and you can find a good quality Narcissus that's perfect for your own color taste. So we always have yellow. There's whites, like I said, pinks oranges, different colors that you can kind of pop for your own gardening taste. So if we kind of look at the classic, you know, I'm driving up here to Skagit Valley here next year to the tulip or the, the daffodil and tulip, and I want to see everything blooming. This is what you're going to see, <clears throat> you know, more up in that foot, foot and a half tall range. You know, if I want pure yellow, I always do Dutch Master. Um, there's, it used to be called King Alfred's, you know, all kinds of good yellow ones. If I like white, Mount Hood's a great choice for you. Maybe I want to, again, add, like the yellow, but I add that the yellow Corona or the orange Corona. Maybe I look for one like Akita. That's another one you'll see quite a bit. If I want to go down in height a little bit, maybe I don't want the foot, foot and a half, but I like that six, eight inch and I want to use these on the borders or in a container. I'm putting some of these in my pot as well. Um, I've got these options for a little bit shorter ones. Teditates, probably the best-selling bulb of all time for me in 30 years. Everybody buys those. We go through quite a bit of them here. That's a classic short yellow Narcissus daffodil for spring. It's a great color, an easy one to grow. Jetfire adds me again that pop of orange in the Corona. And then if I want a little bit of white, we look at a short one called Jack Snipe. So then we get into kind of, again, all kinds of specialty Narcissus. This isn't even the tip of the iceberg, but just to kind of show you some variation, again, large cup, massive Coronas in those, a little bit bigger flower, a little bit larger plant. I've got ones like Ice Follies and Professor Einstein, if I like a little orange. You know, we get into uh, the pinks again here. Now I've got the reverse on the Avalon, yellow base with the white Corona. Um, all kinds of combinations, again, you know, you can kind of pick what you like that way. There's split corona, if you kind of like that double center uh, look to it. Very interesting flower, and that's a that's beautiful cut as well to bring inside. Then we get in to fully double ones. You can see the difference in the flower there. Nice little, you know, kind of, again, foot, 16-inch tall maybe, but I can pick my color and have double daffodils or double narcissus. You know, the pheasant style, these are the ones I'm typically going to get uh, excellent fragrance with as well. You know, when those are blooming, I'll, I'll definitely smell those out in the yard. And then the young quills, you know, this is one I got a package I'll be throwing in with my bulb container. Um, this is, again, a little bit shorter, maybe in that 8 to 12 inch style. These are great for naturalizing, kind of like the Tetitates, but I can mix up my colors a little bit. Um, and I will get some great fragrance on a lot of these. You'll see these packages a lot of times as a blend, like we talked about, 20 bulbs with yellows and whites and different shades mixed together. But when those bloom, makes a really nice presentation, and I'll get some sweet fragrance off it as well. So you'll see a couple more there, the Jean Quills. So there's a Fast and Furious bulb pictures. And again, we record this, so if you if you didn't get a name down, whatever. You will see those on the sheet. I hope you everybody got a copy of the sheet. If you don't, we can email it to you. But you'll see these things listed on the second and third page to just give you a couple of varieties or variety suggestions. But, you know, again, look online, come down to the nursery and look at the variation because I can guarantee you're going to find one like, oh, I really like that color a combination together. And then we get one that, that works for you as well. Okay. 
So give me one second here. I got to pop up and move my table. And we'll do some planting. After I fill this, I probably won't be able to move it. <laughs> We're going to put this right here. Okay. I'm going to grab my food and some bones. Give me one second. So just in case you're curious, I've got seven packages of bowls. A lot of people that work this class every year end up emailing me. Like, I can't believe, let me move the camera just a little bit. I can't believe how many bulbs you put in that container. So, you know, if I would, I should measure this so you get an idea, but this is probably 16 inches across, 16 inches deep. This had a beautiful purple salvia in it this summer at my house with orange million bells spilling out of it. They were looking a little tired. I probably could have left the salvia for a while. The homing bird was upset yesterday when I got home from work and took it out. Um, and I put it in the yard. We'll see if it comes back. But essentially, that's what I do. Summer annuals. Now I've recycled this pot. I can plant it with some bulbs. It sits right above my driveway where I park my truck. I get to drive home January, February, March, April, even into early May and see all kinds of different bulbs coming and going. And then... I can take my bulbs out, add them to the garden if I want, send them to the great compost heap in the sky if I don't want them, and I'll plant my salvia or whatever I want to next year and enjoy that for the rest of the summer. So this is a really cool pot, first of all. If you like containers, they call these boiling glazes. I have a lot of these in my landscape. I use all over the place, but almost an art piece. Every one of these will be a little different. They're a little rough to the touch, but you can see a really thick wall, frost proof, permanent container that I don't ever have to worry about freezing, cracking, or, or doing any damage in the winter, okay? So what I've done so far to save time, you can see in the black hole there, is I filled this up about one third with Edna's potting soil. So I've got myself a good six, eight inches of room that I'm gonna continue to add, uh, and then I'll fill with soil as we go. So if I look at my selections. Again, it's my taste, not yours. You can plant whatever you like in your container. Uh, but I always do alliums. So I picked out two. I wanted some purple and some blue there. So we're going to put these in first. I know these have to be six inches down, but if I read the package, it would tell me that as well. So if I pick out my two alliums, this is going to be towards the bottom because this is going to come up I'll have the foliage out of the ground. That's fine. It's not going to inhibit any of my other creatures from growing. But this will be the last thing to bloom and the tallest thing in my pot. So I always take, to get out of my rut, I think I plant this purple one every single year in my bulb container. <laughs> but I have five there. And so I'm going to simply go to the bottom and set myself up a nice OCD pattern. <laughs> as I chuckle. Of five alliums in a little circle. Those are going to pop up next year and give me kind of the height that I want. This is the first time I'm doing the blue one, so I guess I am breaking out of my rut. So I'm gonna grab these little guys. You could see how big, you know, that was. Look at this little allium. It's like a little mini me. You know, those are tiny, be careful. I might drop one of those when I lost one of my bulbs. Well, I got 15 of these, and these will bloom next spring. They're smaller, but this one doesn't need a large bulb to flower. These will all bloom next year. So carefully, I got 15 of them out there, about the size of a corn kernel. And again, I'm gonna just kind of stagger these in that pot. So these will come up in a nice OCD pattern. Sorry, Nicole. <laughs> so let me pop those in there and then I'll tip this over and you can kind of see what we're looking at. So we've got all these around the bottom. Let me see if I can give them a little push here. And then when I tip this pot over, they won't all fall to one side, right? See how this works. Well, they might make it. So if you can see, oh, there they go, start tumbling. If you can see down there, I got two of them rolling already. But I've set that kind of base. I've got one layer in, and we're going to be doing three layers. How's that? So I got to put these back to where they were, sorry. Okay. Now I'm going to sprinkle just a little bit on top of that I've added about two more inches okay I'm not going to smash it down I'm just going to spread it out nice and evenly 
I'll usually take my fist and just lightly kind of press down so that locks all those into place, okay? Now, like I mentioned, I didn't bring all my bold food and everything here to the nursery, but I always like to use Ultra Bloom in all my containers. This is pure phosphorus, so it's all about flour, it's not about growth, okay? So I'm gonna take just a little, you don't ever have to measure organics if you want to. I'm just gonna take a little small handful and I'm gonna sprinkle some of that on top of the soil. Now, when I water this all winter in the rain waters, it's gonna keep working its way down and I'll have that extra phosphorus available for the spring bloom, okay? So that's layer one. There we go, that looks good. Now I'm gonna hit kind of my intermediate stuff. So I chose some Dutch master daffodils and of course my orange tulips. I love my orange tulips. So there's what, eight of those and 10 tulips in this bag. Now these are again, I'm still down at least six inches from the top of this pot. But if I pull these out, I wanna make sure you know, it's not the end of the world if we plant these upside down, but please do me a favor if I go close to the camera. You can always see on a bowl where the roots were and my growing tips. So just try to keep your tips pointed up. Makes it a little easier for that bulb to say hello come springtime. I've got 10 of these. Now the rain's coming down. Can you hear me okay, Nicole? All right. I can talk pretty loud. Well, I've got 10 of those. And where's my daffodils? We've got eight daffodils here. And again, you know, that is in essence what I'm talking about size matter. That's a massive Narcissus bulb. I'm going to get probably two flower stalks out of all those come springtime. Okay. And again, you can't see in here, but I'm making a nice OCD pattern. When I come up, it'll be all measured properly. Looks perfect. We're going around and a couple down the middle. Okay. And you don't have to do this much. You know, I like my bulbs. I like my spring bulb pot pretty packed. I, 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 I for, forgive me, I, I was trying to remember to take a picture of it last year so you could go like, holy smokes, look at that jungle when it came up. I will remember this year. So the bulb class next year will be like, oh, that's what that planter looked like you did last year. We've got our 10 tulips and some narcissus in here. Again, I'm going to add just a little bit of foam. Kind of cap those off. Lock them into place. Okay. Do my little fist trick, a little light tamping. Okay, and now I've got my last three, and these are going to be a, a little bit more on the shallower side. So I chose some white crocus for really, really early in the season. I've got just a couple purple hyacinths to give me some smell. And then again, we were talking about the jean quill or the shorter daffodils or narcissus. I chose that color. So essentially, you can see the colors I did. I'm going to have white with a little yellow and purple for a month or so. Then I'm going to have the yellow and orange emerging. And as that's just finishing, here comes my purple and my blue on the allium. So we're kind of, again, my my pot, my taste, you can do what you want with yours. So be careful. I'm, I'm kind of immune with my old Calisy 30-year nursery hands. But be real careful with hyacinth. Because a lot of times people grab hyacinth, it'll give you a rash. So I would recommend not doing it like me and putting some gloves on. How's that? I'm just going to take five hyacinths again in a nice, OCD pattern around the edge. That's going to give, actually, these are six. That'll give me a little color first. Okay. And then we're going to spread out do the crocus last. We're going to spread out just a little bit of the white and the yellow daffodils in here. If you could see as I planted this, essentially, I've got one pattern. I alternated a second pattern, now it's a third. Everything's got plenty of room to grow. I'm not 
putting 50 of these in and then another 50, another 50. That's probably too much. But uh, this certainly is not for this size of container. So we're going to mix a little bit of the white, yellow narcissus in here. Oh, almost missed one. Look at that. Okay. So maybe if I, let me see if I can possibly turn this and you can kind of see without them all falling. Can you kind of see in there? I've got all the little points going up. We've got roots going down. We're going to have some happy bulbs. Now, crocus is always funny because you can see on these even right now, I've already got a little sprout coming out. Crocus is always one of those ones that comes a little bit earlier. So I just like the crocus at the edge of the container. Now, this is the shallowest thing. You're going to read on crocus. You don't need to go down more than just a couple inches. Two or three inches is plenty. So I'm going to put a little bit more soil on top of the hyacinths and the daffodils here. These a little bit closer to the rim. You know, I'm still probably three inches from the top here. And now I just want these crocus around the border. When I come home, I want to see the crocus and then all my taller things coming up towards the center. So I'm simply going to take the crocus I like and just put again a nice little OCD. I didn't bring my tape measure, so I won't measure every one of them, but we got them pretty close here. So we do all the crocus around the perimeter. And I've got a beautiful bowl planter. Now at the top here, you saw me put a little bit of the, of the ultra bloom towards the base, okay? I'm gonna sprinkle just a little bit more on the top level here, okay? Just sprinkle a little bit more of that ultra bloom around. So as again, I water this or mother nature does it for me all winter. That's gonna continue to get down through those different layers and I'm gonna have happy bulbs come spring time, okay? Even smells good, and that's organic smell. And now, I'm really done. Let's just cap this off. Uh, last little bit of soil. And again, I think I mentioned at the beginning, when I get home tonight, you know, say you were doing this today at your house and it was gonna be set, I don't wanna carry, you know, put this in my truck full of water and it's even heavier that way. But I'm down just about two inches from the top of this pot, two, three inches. I don't want it overflowing. We don't want it level, but this will settle a little bit, you know, after I water it. When I get home tonight, I'll take probably half a cup of that EB Stone bulb food, sprinkle that over the surface. That's got a little bit more phosphorus, but also some nitrogen. And then I'll put compost as a mulch over the top of this. Looks to me a lot nicer than potting soil. And I'll literally pop it right there on the rocks with my driveway and say, see you next spring. As long as I leave this out where I get rain, it's going to be happy. The worst thing we do is take this and shove it up against the house or put it in the garage and we dry out. Then we're going to struggle come springtime, okay? So just make sure this stays wet. You can kind of see, you know, again, I'm down. You can probably see better right here. I'm down you know, almost the length of my thumb from the top. But when I add that compost, I'm going to be just below the rim here and I'm going to have a beautiful pot come spring time, okay? So now let's see how heavy that is. He's getting a little heavy. We'll take him off. Move the table here. And that's as easy as it gets. I mean, what do we spend there? About 10 minutes. You know, I got a cool bowl planter that I get to enjoy uh, come springtime for two or three months. So for me... You know, a lot of my summer annual containers, yes, I put pansies in and did some other things already, but I'll have five or six of these, a couple on the driveway, one on the deck, patio, the porch, that I'll get to enjoy as I come home and pick, pick some cool bulbs to try. Again, maybe I don't throw that all in the compost. I don't want to think I do that every year. But when I dump that out, I will probably save the crocus. I'll save the hyacinths. I'll grab a couple things throw them in the yard if I want to, store them if I want to, and replant them in the fall. Uh, but then I've got something I can use kind of year after year if I do want to keep them, all right? So there's, there's a bulb container and a, and a quick planting job there. So before we do some questions here, um, just as a reminder with the classes, we always have great discounts here starting today all the way through Friday. If you want to come down and do some shopping, we still got a great selection of bulbs. They're selling out fast, so I wouldn't wait long. We got 20% off all the bulbs at the store. So just come down, simply tell our cashier 
I was at Trevor's Bulb class uh, this weekend. They'll give you the class discount. You'll get 20% off, okay? Uh, we won't have classes next weekend, but in two weeks, I'll be back doing Saturday and Sunday again. Uh, Saturday class on the 23rd, we're doing conifer class. One of my favorites. We'll be going through and showing you all kinds of cool miniature, medium, conifers of all shapes and sizes. And then that Sunday, we call it putting the garden to bed class. Oh, wow. Now it's really coming down. Putting the garden to bed class. And I'll go through some projects for fall, you know, from mulching, how to cut things back, how to store certain plants inside the garage. We turn it into a house plan, but it's a great time for gardeners to jump on that class and ask about specific things. Should I worry about this? Should I store this? Uh, we'll go through quite a bit of that um, on the 24th as well. As that. Okay. So with that, we'll turn it over to Nicole here and see if we got some questions if I can hear her. <laughs> so uh, you just planted all these beautiful bulbs. Can you put blooming? Sorry, let me yell since it's so loud for you in there. Um, <laughs> Can you put plants on top of it? Say pansies, violas, like blooming stuff right now? Well, I can't hear anything. Just a second here. Okay, try again. So once you plant all of your bulbs, can you put blooming stuff on top of it? Like pansies okay. and violas? I, I think you're saying, can I put some stuff on top of all these bulbs? Okay, now you gotta be careful it's not too much. I, you know, if I did this plan in a different way, if I was doing it for men, or maybe I'd go buy a hellebore and I put it right in the middle and I focus my bowl planting on the perimeter. If I cover it with pansies and this and that, yes, most of it will come through, but I'd be real careful not to pack the container and then not have as many of the bolts come up. So try it. To design the bulb container, you know, pick a couple of things maybe you do want to have in there, or leave you know, the thriller in the middle and tuck a few bulbs here and there in some of the gaps, if that makes sense. Yes. It's so loud. Sorry. Sorry, everybody who's not from the Northwest, if you're not feeling this like heavy downpour right now, but um, especially in that greenhouse, it's really hard for him to hear. So sorry if I'm going to yell at you. We're going to do our best to get through this. Um, Hi. So, yeah. Email, I cannot hear Hold on. There's. Yeah, there's a lull. We'll see if we can make it. How do you store the bulbs? What's a good place uh, or ways to store them? How do you store the bulbs? Well, again, um, it, it, after they go dormant, I don't mind if you want to dig them up. I mean, they can dry out. You keep them in a, you know, kind of a, a cool place in the garage. You know, keep them dry. You can put them in a paper bag. You know, we'll go through some of that at the, at the overwintering class as far as storing year to year. But with these creatures, you know, we will be done in June. If we want to pull them up and not leave them in the ground, we can uproot them, set them out to dry, cut the growth off, and then save them and replant them in the fall. That's what you mean. Um, when's the best time to dig those up in order to store them? I can't hear it. Okay. <laughs> This is the first time ever. We're kind of having fun. <laughs> When's the best time to dig up those bulbs in order to store them? So again, it, it goes back to that. That the most important thing when we talked about the beginning is I can't cut the bulbs off until they go dormant on their own. If you cheat and chop them off early, you're going to have minimal flowering that second season. Okay, so wait till they go dormant. Ah, oh, thank you. If we wait till we go dormant, we do this, you know, maybe it's May, maybe it's early June, a little bit of it depends on how the weather goes. But once you see them go yellow and brown and shrivel, yes, we can dig them right up and we've got success storing those for the next season, okay? Gotcha. Now now we can hopefully talk at a normal level since the rain is <laughs> checked down a little. <laughs> uh, um, so when picking bulbs out, we talked about you can get them in a lot of different places. How do you know that you're getting quality? What's, you know, like the premium grade? How do you uh, how do you go about picking out quality bulbs? Well, well, everything is good. You know, specific bulbs are going to have specific sizes. So if I was to tell you daffodils, probably the one I worry about more most 
because I could buy cheap daffodils that are this wide, or you come to Sunnyside, you saw those, the size of the ones I put in that pot. They're just a heavier grade, a little bit more expensive, but I'm gonna get the flowering that I wanna have out of them. I would always grab a package. The first thing I would do is look at it. Okay, they all look like they have good color. There's no mold on them, you know, no black. And then I'm gonna gently touch them to make sure they're not soft. It should be nice and firm when you purchase them. I see sometimes once in a while, to be honest, even ours, you know, we, we might miss a package. I go grab one to grab for a customer. Oh, wait a minute, let's leave that one here and get a different one. We just wanna make sure they're nice and firm and specifically on the tulips, more than anything, I don't wanna see any mold or residue on the outside of the bowl. Gotcha. And if two of them have kind of grown together or fused together, you wanna to leave those together when you plant them or do you wanna break them apart? If, if they have two separate crowns or we have and we have two separate root systems, they certainly can be divided. That's not a problem. Um, probably more on the daffodils or on the, on the, excuse me, on the tulip side, I see that happen a little bit more often. It certainly could with daffodils as well. But even the daffodil bulb, I'd rather have a massive bulb with five flowers coming out of it, you know, giving me a nice display come that next year. Gotcha. Um, switching gears a little bit, we talked about some, you know, the diseases tulips can get and how to manage that. Do you need to be worried that that is going to affect your other bulbs or is it specific just to tulip varieties? Tulip rod is kind of tulip rod. It's just yeah. going to be on, you know, species tulips, hybrid, all the different types of tulips, but that's a pretty specific one for those. Gotcha. And if you're planting bulbs outside, not in a container in the ground, and you've got really, somebody's got really dense clay soil, what's the best way to go about amending that to, to give them the proper environment they need? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't need two feet of, of, you know, perfect soil to grow any kind of bulb in, but I probably need a good foot. So what I would tell you to do is you're going to have to do some excavating, dig through that clay layer, get some of that out of there, period, add the compost mix that all up and now I should have a nice base layer where I can plant a bulb six inches down, have another six inches for it to get a nice root system and not sit in that standing water on the clay surface. Gotcha. Um, speaking of six inches, when you were planting up your container, you mentioned specifically with the alliums that they needed six yep. inches, but they were pretty far down in the pot. And, yep. you know, you mentioned that you were doing them first because they were the last ones to bloom and they were tall. So are those planting depths kind of suggestions? Can you, like, how do well, you? It, it may not seem like it in that pot, but it, it definitely may, may be a little towards eights. Okay. I don't want to go much deeper than that. You want to stick with kind of what's on that package. I know just because I do alliums every year, I, I plant that pot pretty much the same every year anyway, <laughs> that that's the perfect depth. I always have great luck with alliums. And it, you know, it's hard to scale on the camera, but I mean, that entire pot's only a foot deep. So when I started out, I was, you know, now when I add my compost, maybe I'm seven inches or so on top of the alliums, but after that settles down, I'll be just fine. And when you were putting the soil on top, you're just putting a layer enough to kind of cover what's there yep. so you can't see it, not yep. anything too thick, correct? Well, and again, it kind of locks all that layer in, then I can build up and then add my next layer. Because you kind of saw the bottom was very open, very spaced out with minimal alliums. Then I did the opposite pattern in the middle, so everything's kind of in a gap, and that top was literally around the rim with the crocus, so nothing's gonna interfere uh, with the next as they grow. Do you have to put seven bags in there? Probably not. You know, you don't have to do quite that many. You could pick just two or three things that you like. Um, that's just one. It's my spot right where I park my truck. So I always tend to get quite a bit in there with the colors I like. Cool. I'll make sure you take a picture this year. I'll reach out remind to you. Me, I'll sure. get one. Yeah. <laughs> you set a reminder. <laughs> um, you talked about adding that you like to add compost on top um, instead of potting soil. Could you also do mulch? Do you advise against that? Does it matter? Well, I, I don't mind any kind of mulch. You know, compost is always a great soil builder. You could put, if you're a bark person, I, I honestly, years ago, I used to use nugget bark. Like I'd go buy orchid bark because I like the thicker woody chunks on it. I, it doesn't matter what it is. Be really careful with bark in particular. If I'm going to do this, <clears throat> maybe I'm not going to replant this and I just want it to be a bulb planter year after year, add a little extra more fertilizer underneath that mulch layer because my issue with bark or woody mulch is, is that degrades. We're going to take nitrogen out of the soil. We're going to have a little bit unhappier bulbs. So if you do a woody mulch, 
just a little bit extra fertilizer towards the top and, and you'll be fine. And how long um, does soil or compost usually stay good? Like if you don't use, you know, a whole bag when you're planting, yeah. how long can you expect it to still be usable? It, it's always usable. The issue is going to be where was it stored and how dry is it? You know, we call it hydrophobic. If I have an old, I the same way, I'll smile as I always find, oh man, I forgot I had that bag behind the house. It, it, if it's really bone dry, what we want to do is dump it in a bucket and put some water on it and let it rehydrate. Then we can use it just the same. It never goes bad. Um, I should say this, you know, that was potting soil. Edna, I mentioned I had a salvia in there. I had million bills. It was a beautiful summer container since May that I had in the same exact spot. When I dug that out, it was roots and all. I'm not leaving, you know, half tired potting soil. I had a little bit left at the base, maybe three or four inches that had no roots in it. I left that and then added all fresh from there. If I take tired potting soil, chop up old root system, again, less nutrition, less room for these new plants to develop in the same container. Gotcha, good tip. Um, if you want bulbs that uh, you wanna let them naturalize, should you mm -hmm. fertilize after the blooms are done, but the, while the foliage is still green? Yep. How do you wanna now, do that? Now that's a great question because I honestly probably should have mentioned that. I don't don't care a naturalizing or any kind of bulb. If I want to leave that in the ground, again, I'm feeding it right now when I plant them. So I go home this weekend, I pop a bag of species tulips in, I'm going to add a little bone meal, a little, a little bulb food, whatever my thing is to get them going. If I want to maximize, I'm going to go out there, say next spring, first of March, and add that same fertilizer again, preferably the bulb food, so we have some nitrogen in there as well. Now, in last year, the food I put down now is what's giving me my push next spring. The storage for 2023 at that point would be what I add in March, if that makes sense. So I'm always staying a year ahead. If I want, man, I'm, I was disappointed with that bulb. The amount of flour I got has been in the ground. Don't dig them up and pitch and put food on that right away in March. Now I can energize, grow my bulb bigger. The next year I get the reward of that. Gotcha. That makes sense. Um, so you mentioned bone meal or bulb food. For those of us that don't have experience enough to, to have a go-to, what's the difference? What do, how do we know which one to use? Well, either one's good. I mean, kind of traditionally bulbs came around, people went straight for the bag of bone meal because it is pure phosphorus. There's nothing else in there. It honestly would be the same thing I'm doing with my ultra bloom. You know, that's all phosphorus. If you look at the numbers on there, I'm zero, well, zero, 10, 10. This has got phosphorus and potassium. I have no nitrogen in there. So yes, that's going to help me with my bud and bloom, which is the point of this. If next spring, let's say I'm not going to take that planter apart, I'm going to go straight for something like bold food because that would have the nitrogen as well as the phosphorus potassium. Now I can help that bulb store energy, get ready to go. And then the next year I'd have even, even a more impressive display, if that makes sense. Gotcha. And kind of same question we were talking about the soil and compost. Can those bags last for a little while if you don't use yeah. it all in one season? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, you know, I wouldn't leave my bag of potting soil sitting out in the rain. That's not what I'm saying. I would always roll up the lip, store it behind the house, keep it in the garage. It's just, a, you know, six months goes by and it's dry. Just make sure you rehydrate it before you use it. Same thing with compost. I always have four or five bales behind the house and some of it's wet, some gets a little dry. But again, as soon as I add water or mix that into the ground or my pot, it's gonna rehydrate very easily. So speaking of watering, how do you know, um, like how much water, you know, you mentioned you're gonna take that pot home when it's not so heavy and water it there. Um, you know, how do you know how to keep up with the watering over the course of the winter and spring and when it is time to water and all that? That's, that's another great question. So again, in our climate here, as we just got done with the torrential downpour, I'm gonna water this once and I'm really gonna water it. I want everything to settle. I want it to firm up. I'll put my compost in, my, my food when I get home on the top. And then I'm, I, as long as I leave that out in the weather, I'm not gonna worry about that for one second of my life, probably till next May, because we're gonna have enough regular rain. Say we get some sort of weird March drought, you know, it's still gonna be cool. We're gonna have heavy dews. You know, maybe I'd walk out there and check it like twice a week, you know, that same pot last year packed with months of bloom as we went through. I, you know, it's probably once a week for me 
if we didn't get rain in March and April, we did get a little bit warmer early this year in our climate. So May was a little bit more for me. At that point, my bulbs came out, I used some in the yard, and then I went straight for my summer annual. So if I left it through the summer, you know, I would always do the knuckle test. If I go to the edge of that pot and I poke my finger in, if I'm dry up two knuckles or a couple inches, then I'll probably give it a drink. If I, a lot of times with a container, you look at the surface, it's crusty dry, but I got all the moisture I'd ever need down below there. So always check before you're going, oh, I got to water it again. In a pot, you know, I don't know that you could ever overwater it. You know, it's always going to drain through and find the drain holes and be okay. In the ground, in the, on the other hand, maybe we got to make sure we don't overwater a little bit. Gotcha. Um, somebody just asked us a question. Hopefully we can work this out. It says, uh, when bulbs send out sprouts, should we harden them harden them off by introducing them to the sun gradually? Does that make sense? Hmm. I'm wondering if they're starting them indoors or... I mean, the ground, you send out shoots, you're going to acclimate it anyway. Maybe they're talking if they're starting them in a greenhouse or they had them in the house and they're transplanting them out. We would want to wait till after frost for sure if we're starting them in a different environment. Um, and yeah, if you, you know, if I had tulips in the house in a pot, you know, I'd probably leave them out in the shade outside for a week or two, then take the pot and plant. Sometimes you go down to the you know, floor shop in March and you can buy a little six inch pot with five tulips in it, bring it in the house, enjoy the flowers. And, oh, I want to see if these grow outside. Maybe that's what they're thinking. Um, in that case, yes, I'd want to wait till after frost because they're, they're forced. Honestly, when they do that, they've been forced in an indoor environment. Now I don't have a danger of frost. Now I can maybe put them in a little bit of shade, maybe a couple hours of morning sun, then a week, week or so later, move them out into full sun. Gotcha. Um, last question. It's a little off topic, but we talked about repels all being good for bulbs and keeping. Um, somebody asked if you can use that on roses or other shrubs and plants. Yeah, repels all you can use as a liquid or granular. You can do it either way. Um, you know, typically with bulbs, because we're in the ground, I'm using more of a powder. Um, if it was a foliage plant like you're talking about, get the liquid if you want. Um, it lasts, you know, if it's a little drier, you probably get a month out of it. Maybe when it's raining sideways, probably a couple weeks. Um, and that's not, you know, I don't want you to think it's the end all be all. I mean, it works great for some people. Other people are like, you got to be kidding me. I put that down the next day. He came up and just dug right through the layer I, I did. It works most of the time. But to me, it's the starting point, you know, before we get red in the face and grab some sort of pellet gun or other device that we don't want to hurt the animals with try the repellent, see if we can get them to head somewhere else or browse a different area. And then, then we can always go to, to phase two. Gotcha. Um, sorry, for real, last question. Somebody's talking about um, that pot. What did you call the finish on that pot? The Yeah, those are what we call boiling glaze. And they come, I, I think they're some of the coolest pots available to gardeners now. We get a huge amount of these. We still got a pretty good chunk right now. We have a massive amount coming in the winter again, but it's a really high quality glazed pot. It's just everyone's a little different um, because of the treatment they do to them. So they call them boiling glazes because it shows a little glass, multiple colors. And again, it, you know, I kind of went for these color tones. It could be eight, nine, ten different other ones. We get all kinds of, we've got probably eight different colors of these in right now and different shapes and sizes like other pottery. It's just something fun. You know, I, I got orange, I got black, I got blue, I got red, I got other colors in the yard as well. But certain areas, I've really found those almost look like little art pieces, you know, really kind of kind of fun pots that are a little more unique. Gotcha. Um, it's funny because I keep saying it's the last question and then more pop up. So right. <laughs> sorry. That's all right. Um, you're, keep, you're keeping me dry in here. I'm all right with that. Yeah, there you go. Well, well, and the sun is now coming out. So, you know, we've got crazy weather here. Um, somebody asked about, can you put wire mesh on top of your um, containers to keep squirrels out? Will the bulbs still grow through them okay? Or is that a problem for your plants? Uh, I've never had to. I don't mind the wire idea as long as it's not fine mesh. You're going to have issues with things coming through it. If you've got, you know, larger squares, yes, things will find their way through that. But I wouldn't get like real tight mesh metal. I think you're going to struggle to get most of those plants through there. Gotcha. Okay. I think for real, that's it.
Um, right. <laughs> um, so if something does come up um, and you've got questions, you know, please feel free to reach out to us. We say this all the time, but it's incredibly true. Um, we love to talk about gardening. We live it. We're here seven days a week. Um, send us an email, sunnyside nursery at msn.com. Give us a call. Um, Trevor's here for the rest of the day. If you want to send us an email, he'd be happy to kind of answer your specific question or situation. Um, and hopefully you got a lot out of this. I know I did. Um, and you can catch the recording again later if you want to go take notes or just refresh. Um, and we've got more classes coming up. We've got a few more of the rest of this year. Two weeks from now, we'll be seeing Trevor again for essential evergreens and then uh, how to kind of close up your garden for the winter. And we kind of talked about it a little bit yesterday. We're heading into the holiday season. Um, once we kind of stop classes at, towards the middle of November, we start selling wreaths. Um, here in the nursery, you can come make them, which is always really fun to do as a family project or with friends. Um, and huge, beautiful wreaths. We kind of help you make them yourself. Or we're selling them online. So if you're not local, um, um, you know, you can get one, one of our great quality fresh wreaths from us online, send them as a gift, get one for yourself. So those will all go on sale uh, the beginning of November. So something to look forward to. Um, in the meantime, we hope that you have a wonderful day and another great next weekend. We won't see you and we'll see you back in two weeks. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. I hope the rain has stopped. So we shall see today, but either way, it's a good day always to get out gardening. So thanks for joining us.